when Sean walked into his office with a rather wild proposal for setting up a data science academy and producing the data scientists in this economy so desperately, desperately needs. Um, and Ian had luckily the budget, but also more importantly the vision and foresight to see how this could be. Um, the word visionary gets chucked around a lot, but in terms of the um, <coughs> the transformation of this country and the society into something that can really compete digitally on the global stage. Ian truly deserves the name of the visionary and it's a real pleasure to welcome him here today. Would you please help me in this welcome? Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning, Johannesburg. Are you still up there? Are they there? Can they hear us? Just checking. You can never show. Sure. Never again, Joe Berg, they'll be saying that you're a little bit behind, right? This time around, they've got the delay in the signal, so it doesn't often happen that way around. So, so thanks for the introduction. That's very kind. Uh, this morning, I'm really going to talk about something that, unusually for me, I actually know something about. I'm going to talk about me. It's a deeply, deeply favourite subject of mine. My wife gets very frustrated about me always talking about me, but you're going to have to sit there for the next hour and listen to the story. And the importance of the story and the relevance of the story, really, I hope, will be to pull out a couple of different themes. Because you guys have joined the Explore Data Science Academy for a reason, I hope. And I'm assuming that reason at some point is to use the new skills your new abilities, your newfound knowledge in a way that allows you to develop a career that in turn allows you to make some money. Fair? Now some of you may be here for entirely intellectual reasons, purely because you're interested in learning. And I'm very, very happy for you. But that doesn't work for me, okay? I'm a good old-fashioned capitalist and I like cash and money, okay? And if you guys want to be relevant, and we're going to come back to that in a minute, in our society and relevant in our economy, then there are some things you need to think about. And I have learned over the last 27, 28 years in business a lot of stuff the hard way. And hopefully just to short circuit some of your learning and some of your thinking, I want to share some of the shit and the crap and the nonsense that I've been through to give you a bit of a fast track through some of the same kind of parallel processes that you guys might want to think about. And I'm specifically going to try and call out a couple of things. Number one, career consciousness. What does it mean to be conscious about the choices that you make when you decide to study something, when you decide to take a job, when you decide to go and do something different? So as I talk through the story of Ian, we're going to talk a little bit about career consciousness and think about what career consciousness means to you. And then through this we're also going to talk about relevance. Now the single biggest fear for most businesses, small, big, young or old, is irrelevance. The second a business becomes irrelevant to its customers, it doesn't make any money. There are some very easy examples of irrelevance that we can talk about. I could talk about the South African post office. Totally irrelevant in our lives these days, right? It allowed itself to get into irrelevance because it didn't really understand what the customer needed and didn't have the management skills and bandwidth to keep itself relevant. Anybody remember a brand called Kodak or a brand called Nokia, right? They all lost their relevance to their customer base. They became irrelevant because of a lack of consciousness and understanding what the customer wanted. Now flip that back for a second and talk about your personal relevance. Because if you personally become irrelevant to the economy, if you personally allow yourself to get lazy around your relevance to an employer, you're going to struggle to make more of that filthy, dirty cash, right? And that's what we're here for. Okay. So as we go through this story, we're going to talk about career consciousness, making decisions consciously around what you want to do when you grow up and consciously thinking about the relevance of your skill set and the way that you behave to potential employers, to the economy, and to the wider society. So relevance is a critical thing that we're going to talk about. Career consciousness is critical. And then within the story, I'm going to pick up two or three further points. Two or three sets of skills that you will not get taught in the Explore Data Science Academy, and you rarely get taught anywhere, which I believe, having looked after 
worked inside many large businesses in many parts of the world, I believe actually really important. And we're particularly going to talk about these three skills. We're going to talk about the skill of communicating. The skill of communicating. Because you might have the biggest brain in the world. You might be the best data scientist or data analyst in the world. But if you cannot get your message across in a way that other people can understand, then everything gets lost in translation. And you won't be viewed as somebody who's relevant to the success of a business. So communication skills we'll talk a little bit about and what you might want to do around that. We need to talk about how you manage the dreaded things called stakeholders. Because wherever you land up, in whatever business you want to go and do, whatever you want to set up, there are people around you called stakeholders that have a big influence. And your ability to understand the different constituencies of stakeholders and their vested interests, more than your interests, is a critical management tool and technique that you need to develop over time. And you won't get taught that in school, right? So stakeholder management and communication skills are both utterly essential things that you need to develop. The final thing that you need to develop and be very, very thoughtful around is really understanding how you can show people around you the value that you add. And it feels like a very naked, a very sort of overtly ambitious thing to say. English people like me are supposed to be very self-effacing, we don't talk about that stuff, but unless you can peel back the layers of the onion for the people around you so they can see your value, why would they bother paying you? Fair? So we're going to talk about all of those things over the next sort of 35, 40 minutes through the story of my career and the choices and the fuck-ups that I've made over that time. Okay? It's very straightforward. It's easier to learn by other people that have done stuff. And then I'm going to try and save sort of quarter of an hour, 20 minutes at the tail end of this for any questions that you guys in this room may have and the folks in Johannesburg have. Is that okay? Cool. So let's start at the beginning. You may have detected from the accent that I'm not from around these parts. I grew up in a very cold, wet, rainy part of the United Kingdom split between England and Wales. They call them actually the Welsh marches. Marches because it's really wet, okay? And funny enough, the Welsh marches are not really in Wales. They're kind of in England and Wales. So one end of my parents' farm was in uh, Wales, one end was in England. So I grew up middle of nowhere, absolute middle of nowhere, basically, okay? Uh, the entertainment there was really sort of five or six sheep that you tethered to a lamppost, you know? You get the point. So, not a lot going on, right? Very small, sleepy village. There were a lot more sheep than there were people. I went to a small local school around the corner. I mean, just think like the Karoo, right? But with rain, you know, you get the point. So there wasn't much going on. Uh, and I made my big breakout from that town when I was 18. I went to the local school. I got a few, uh, what we used to call O-levels and A-levels. You guys called them a trick. I was a very, very average scholar. For all of you in this room, who have got here, I know that you are not average scholars. I know already that you have an intellect, an intellectual horsepower that we might need to do something with, because horsepower by itself in an engine doesn't work unless you've got a gearbox, right? But I know because you're here, because I really understand the selection processes that the Explore Data Science Academy uses. I've seen the data. I was part of helping set this place up a year or two ago. I know that you are intellectually very highly geared, right? I know that you have that intellectual horsepower. You're in the top right-hand corner of your peer groups in this country. I wasn't, okay? I wasn't. I was firmly, firmly middle of the class on a good day when I was listening, okay? <laughs> Which wasn't very many days. Anyway, so I scraped my way through to a university, a just, and I wasn't certainly clever enough to go to one of the ones that you've heard of. It wasn't Oxford and it wasn't Cambridge. But I went to another very wet place called Swansea, which is on the coast of Wales. And I chose, and I guess this is the one of the first choices that you start to make and the first relevant think thinking points. I chose to study something called economics. Now, why did I choose to study economics? Well, partly because I didn't get good enough grades to be able to study one or two of the other subjects that I might have liked, particularly the sciences that I'd really fancy, but I just didn't get good enough grades. But also economics is interesting because when you start to think about an economy, you kind of think about where you're sitting today, what you do today, whether you've gone down to pick and pay this morning to buy something, whether you've had to have a petrol in your car, whether you're thinking about what you've got to do here in terms of the value you're going to add to the organizations you want to join, we're all part of something called the economy, right? 
And it struck me early on, and it was a conscious choice, that the more I could understand about the way that economies worked, the better chance I might have of actually making some money for myself. So it wasn't a careless thought, it wasn't a lazy thought, but it was also born a necessity. I wasn't bright enough, I didn't get good enough grades to necessarily do the thing I really wanted to do, but I was making the best of what I had at the time to be able to study something that I thought might be useful. So I read economics for three years in Swansea. Swansea is particularly well known in the United Kingdom for being the second wettest university campus in the country. Okay, a lot of rain. Okay, a lot of rain. But let's be honest, we don't all go to university just to learn. And actually, when it's raining, you might as well stay inside. And if you're staying inside, you might as well have a drink. And if you're staying inside having a drink, you might as well talk to some girls. And if you're staying inside having a drink, talking to some girls, well, you might as well get some other experiences as well, right? <laughs> so I came, out of, uh, I came out of university having had a lot of alcohol, a lot of sex, and I got a degree. So I thought it was kind of a, you know, a fairly average outcome, right? I mean, can't really argue with that. And in the last year of university, we began to be asked, what are you going to do next? Right? So the UK is quite a, uh, an interesting and a very generous scheme when it comes to universities. You broadly go to university for free. It's a very different model to South Africa. But once you finish that, you're done. Right? You've got to go out and find somebody that's going to pay you some money for this newfound skill, these newfound qualifications that you've got in being able to persuade girls to spend time with you and to drink. Right? So big organizations come in the UK to your campus and they try and sell themselves to you. But it was a tricky year. I was graduating in 1991, 92. I told you I'm old. And the economy was in a downturn. And there was nonsense going on about Europe and the currency. Sounds familiar, right? Nothing changes. And I wanted to apply for jobs in marketing, sales and marketing, OK? Because that's where all the prettiest girls worked basically, and it sounded most glamorous, and you got expense accounts, and you drove around the country, and you sold stuff. But you know what? From a wet university that wasn't one of the tier one universities, with a degree that wasn't a first class degree, with no background in marketing, I got absolutely nowhere when it came to thinking about marketing. Okay? Just couldn't get in. So I thought, you know what? Economics has taught me a few things. Economics has taught me some simple stuff, actually. Supply and demand is important, right? Where there is oversupply of something, and there was an oversupply of graduates wanting to become marketing people, because it was seen as a very sexy, glamorous career, then the demand pattern is different. People can be more selective. So I began to think about where wasn't the oversupply? What was an unsexy, not a trendy profession? People might argue, funnily enough, that data Data analytics and computer coding and stuff when I was growing up, that was deeply unsexy, deeply uncool. But something else that was also really uncool and unsexy at the time was buying stuff. And my economics degree had taught me enough to realize that the economy really breaks down into only three things. Now think about this, this is important. The economy is only made up of three groups of activity. People who buy stuff, people who make stuff, and people who sell stuff. There's nothing else in the economy. So when you start thinking about career consciousness and consciously thinking about what you're going to do, you're either going to end up helping people buy stuff and your skills as data scientists and data analysts actually make you hugely valuable from a procurement buying supply chain perspective because you really understand consumption patterns, you really understand the way that we make, you know, all that kind of stuff comes in. Making stuff, factories, are really important to our economy. One of the pilots that we were running in BCX from a data science perspective a while ago was looking at the Weetabix line, right, down at Pioneer Foods. Why? Because if you can take a couple of percentage out of the wastage of the brand that goes into Weetabix, you have a material impact on the company's profitability. So you can make stuff or you can sell stuff. So I wasn't good enough, sexy enough, bright enough, clever enough, whatever, to become a marketing person, okay? The making stuff thing, I hadn't read engineering university. I hadn't done one of the classic degrees that put you into manufacturing. But more than that, to be honest with you, it struck me that people who worked in manufacturing had to get dirty a lot and do like real work. And that didn't appeal either, okay? quite frankly. So I thought, you know what, I'll try this the buying thing. And I started to apply for jobs in supply chain and procurement. This was in 1991. Supply chain and procurement was a fairly well understood discipline at the time, but not quite maybe as developed as it is these days. And because I'd been thoughtful, I'd been conscious around my choice, 
I could talk the talk, so my communication skills were already coming through quite nicely. I managed to convince a couple of companies to offer me a job in procurement. And I joined in 1992 Ford Motor Company. Everybody heard of Ford? Ford, when I joined it, was the third largest company in the world. Number two was General Motors, and number one was General Electric. Does anybody in this room know how many of those companies are still in the top 100 companies in the world? One. And even they are struggling to stay there, right? So the relevance of that business model and that business today in 2019 has just disappeared, and we'll come back to that. But I joined the world's third largest company. And as the world's third largest company, and as somebody who made motor cars, it was really, really good at procurement and supply chain. But I didn't join them because of that, because I didn't really know that, to be honest with you. I got in, right? I got three job offers from them and two other companies. I joined Ford very simply because they were offering me £1,442 more a year than anybody else. So I'm a capitalist, right? So I made a very clear choice. I wanted to earn as much money as I possibly could. So I took the guy's offer that made me the most money. It was that straightforward. So my career consciousness there, you know what? Probably a bit skewed. I think I made the right decision in retrospect, but I made it potentially for the wrong reason. And it's something we all do from time to time. So be very careful of those filters. So I joined, I joined Ford Motor Company. I became a baby buyer. In my first uh, eight to 12 months, I was allowed to buy toilet cleaner, Tampax, uh, window lean, anything that was basically called janitorial supplies. Given a desk, a telephone, and something in those days that was really, really, really interesting, a PC with an email address in 1992. I hadn't come across somebody with an email address before in 1992. This was really exciting. And in fact, the engineering release base, which was called the Worldwide Engineering Release Base in Ford at the time, was the world's second largest database and the world's largest source of raw data. The only thing that was bigger in those days was the American national insurance uh, system that captures all your, uh, your personal detail. And so I suddenly I had access to all these enormous computer systems that was running this great big company. And I got really interested in it. I thought, this is, this is really cool. I hadn't studied computer science, nothing. And I suddenly found a couple of things. Number one, I was getting really interested in the technology that was around me. Now, the supplier of all these systems in those days was that well-known international powerhouse in the IT world, Wang. <laughs> Anybody ever heard of Wang? I think the average age in this room was about 22, 23, yeah, give or take. So Wang went into an administration before you guys were born, okay? But at the time, when I joined Ford in 1992, it was the world's largest manufacturer of things to go on your desktop. It was bigger than IBM, bigger than everybody else in the world, Wang, okay? Google it, ask your grandparents about it, okay? They're no longer relevant. And why not? Because Wang did not understand the difference between a dumb terminal and a PC that actually had something inside it that did things for you. And it didn't understand the critical importance behind some bloke called Bill Gates developing something called DOS, and the rest, as they say, is history. They missed the relevance point. The world's largest computer company in 1992 does not exist today. But I got really interested in technology, I got really interested in systems, and I began to learn more. And in fact, my next job in Ford, I thought, I'll go and step sideways. Okay? So a career consciousness around taking another job that gave me access to buying IT technology and infrastructure. And I did that for a year, 18 months. Knew nothing about it when I started, knew nothing about it when I finished, but it was fun. Okay. But for 18 months, I had one of the world's largest budgets working, remember, for the world's third largest company to buy IT stuff. And, it, and I learned the most enormous amount. And I can still tell you more now about the inner workings of IBM's early mainframes than I should probably be able to. But I'd made some choices already, you see. I'd started buying janitorial supplies. Now, it wasn't, to be honest, a difficult conversation to move away from buying stuff for the toilet, OK? But I knew very clearly I wanted to now get different portfolio skills, leveraging some of the stuff that Ford was teaching me, which was about how to buy stuff properly, to look at the economics of procurement, to look at supply chain. And one of the things that you learned very quickly, and I remember it very, very uh, significantly with Ford, American company, OK? one of the first things they did was start to talk to you about presentation and communication skills. Have I got any slides today? Anybody see any slides? I've ever missed something, right? How many people come and will give a 45 minute, an hour talk, conversation, presentation, anything, 
without slides these days, or notes? How many? You'll hardly ever see it happening. Okay? There are a few of us that do it, very, very few. Why do we do it? Well, number one, probably because we're incredibly stupid. <laughs> number two, maybe because we just said the same things too, too many times over and over again. It's quite possible. But number three, because actually you connect better with an audience when they're looking at you, they've got nothing else to distract them behind them, and you're having a conversation rather than a presentation. Now, I learned that in 1992, 1993 with a very large company that took the time and energy to invest in me to give me some of these skills. And to be fair, those days when we gave presentations, we didn't have PowerPoint. It wasn't invented. Okay? You imagine that. PowerPoint doesn't exist. What do you do? You had acetate slides, OHP, and you put them down, you took one off, you put one down, you took one off. But no, we were taught to have conversations. It was a skill that we were being given. So think about that as you choose your employers. Who is going to invest in you? And who will be best placed to give you skills that are relevant, not when I was growing up in 1992, but skills that are relevant moving forward? And I would argue right the way through that your ability to communicate and present will be one of the differentiating things that you do in your careers moving forward. And I was lucky enough to be given the opportunity to develop some of that 25, 26 years ago and then develop that skill over time. And it's critical. It's one of the three things I said at the beginning we were going to touch upon, communication skills. So I bought systems, I bought IT, I bought computer consultancy. We had some analytics people, funny enough, because these great big databases. But I was getting bored. And I got offered one of the best jobs I've ever had in my life. I got offered the opportunity to buy all of the performance <coughs> engines for Ford Motor Company, including all the Formula One stuff for Cosworth, and all of the stuff that we put in the serious sports cars that at the time Ford was making. And in those days, Ford used to own brands like Aston Martin and Jaguar and others, okay? So there I was, 24, 25, being asked to buy all of these performance engines. And would you really mind just going to that Grand Prix to make sure that, yeah, mm. let me think about that for a moment. And would you really mind just driving home the Aston Martin DB7 just to test that it's okay? okay. <laughs> yeah, let me think about that for a second. So I'm 24 years old. I'm driving around uh, Essex, which is where uh, Ford was based in the UK in those days, in a DB7. And we remember them there, like the old versions of the, the Aston Martins with a little drop head. And it would be fair to say that a little bit like being at university, I was not short of female company, and I had a lot of fun. I was flying all around the world buying these very, very expensive pieces of kit. Now, an engine's got 950 or 1,000 components, and you're suddenly responsible for enormous complexity. And some of the things that I began to be getting involved with are things like Kaizen, value analysis, value engineering, a whole set of new tools that I needed to learn, and I did. And everything I began to learn, I wanted to make sure I got good at it. So I'd spend more and more time than I ever thought that I would on the factory floor with the engineers, particularly at Cosworth and also with Yamaha in Japan, really trying to understand process improvement, lean engineering, all that kind of stuff. But still before this stuff was particularly sexy. Why? Partly because I was intellectually interested, but also because I understood that this opportunity to learn probably wasn't going to be given to me again. It was remarkable. 24, 25-year-old kid being allowed to get, get really deep down and dirty on the shop floor. Something I didn't think I, was going to, I wanted to do, right? I began to pick up a whole load of new skills. And what's very interesting about process engineering, and you'll find this, is if you get good process skills married to your type of skills, data analytics and data science, now you can make shit happen, right? Because you can't do a great deal with the analytics by themselves unless somebody can then go come behind it and sort out the processes or change things that need to be changed. So I was beginning to build up a very relevant set of skills for the mid-90s when automotive manufacturing was still big, Ford was still the third largest company in the world. I was getting, see what I mean? I was building up consciously a career. And Ford said to me, we're going to give you an even bigger job. We'd like you now to manage that portfolio plus some other stuff over here and take a broader global role. I was 25. And I said, no. I said no. And I actually, instead, was approached and took a job working for a large bank called Barclays Bank PLC, which, when I joined it, and there's a theme here, was one of the world's largest banks. It was in the top 10 largest banks in the world in 1997 when I joined them. 
So hang on, so there I am, I'm driving home in my DB7, looking after all these performance engines, I'm spending more time on an aeroplane in first class than I am at home, I'm learning lots of new skills around value engineering, Kaizen, I'm really, really enjoying what I'm doing. Why on earth would you give it up? I gave it up because I could see myself doing the same things I was doing three, four, five years time, because I was having so much fun, but I couldn't see the value that it was going to add to my CV, my career, of just doing the same things but bigger and bigger all of the time. I couldn't see the value. It was a really conscious, you might argue, cynical decision. But I realized if I got to the age of 30, I'd only have worked in one industry and I'd only done one thing, buying, right? Supply chain, procurement type stuff. And people would start to pigeonhole me. I didn't want to be pigeonholed. I was enjoying the flying around, I was enjoying driving the flash cars. But I made a very conscious decision that I needed to go and do something different, otherwise I could be there for too long. And the decision that I made was I had a specialism, it was procurement and supply chain at the time. I didn't feel I would be credible trying to change a discipline as well as a sector. So I looked for roles in a different sector that had the same relevance to the skills that I had begun to develop. So I found a role working for a large bank, heading up their procurement supply chain division, where they had very, very young, embryonic and immature skills. And suddenly I got there and I was a whiz kid. They didn't know how to do this stuff because they make money hand over fist, the banks. They got no idea. So suddenly I was like some kind of child genius. But, and this is a really big but. I'd learned a lot of stuff at Ford, right? One of the real secrets that I had learned was how to take a word, okay, and split it down the middle and put an expletive in it and then close the word. Ford was world class at swearing, right? We had more expletives and more words than you could possibly use. And coming out of a sheltered university upbringing, I was quite shocked and I kind of I quite enjoyed it. But you know where you are, four or five years working somewhere, you just start swearing the whole time. You may have noticed it today, right? I've been trying my best to bring it down. And because I've been working on shop floors, I've been working in the factory, I've been negotiating with engineers and talking to suppliers who make stuff, I used to wear jeans, t-shirts, stuff that was appropriate for a factory. And when I did put a suit on, I was very proud of the suit that I had. It was a really nice green shiny number. Okay. <laughs> and I had about three ties that were thin leather things because they were really popular then in the mid 90s. And I walk up in this bank, one of the world's biggest banks, okay, set up in 1690, 1690, so it's a 400 year old bank, give or take, one of the biggest banks in the world, and everybody there was cleverer than me because they'd been to Oxford and they'd been to Cambridge, but critically, they had joined the bank at the age of 21, which was normal. The way that banks work, they take you in from those expensive universities that I wasn't clever enough to get into, remember, and they take the best of the best, and then they train you, and you go on a long, long, long winded graduate trainee scheme, four or five years they have in the banks in those days, and then suddenly you've got this cohort of folks your age, but have been there for four or five years. They know all the secret code words, right? They know how to dress. They understand that you don't swear, let alone breaking up a word and putting a swear word in the middle. Doesn't happen in London, in the city, in banking, okay? I didn't know any of that stuff. So I rock up as this shit hot, serious procurement dude in a business that doesn't like or know what procurement is, using the wrong type of words, but probably even worse, dressing in the wrong way. Now this may sound really silly, okay? Remember at the beginning I said you need to think about stakeholders and stakeholder management. When people talk about stakeholder management, they're often talking about mirroring and fitting in, okay? Any of you interested ever in the art of flirtation and seduction, okay? Think about mirroring. What it is, is you look at the partner that you're desperately trying to get in bed with, and you think about their or her behavior, his behavior, and you start to mirror them. You start to use some of the same um, words, the same paraphrases, you mirror the cadence of their voice and their body language. It's a well-known way of becoming admitted into a society, whether it's a society of chimps, or whether it's, it's a society of humans. It's a way of making contact and establishing a rapport with somebody. It's called mirroring. Trust me, check it out. What I was doing was the opposite, right? I'd landed like a Martian on Earth, blundering my way around. 
And I got called into my big boss's office on my second day because I'd sworn the day before at a supplier, which apparently you're not supposed to do. And said, look, guys, you can't do this. And I got another complaint a few weeks later. So I'd landed with no understanding of who my stakeholders were, with no real consciousness or thought about how to communicate, not in a factory, not with engineers, not with people who made cars, but with old-fashioned bankers. And it's one of the most salutary lessons that I've ever learned and you should be thoughtful around. As and when you leave the Explore Data Science Academy, which will have a different culture and a different way of doing stuff, it's very informal, it's structured around something like that. It's got its own ways of doing stuff. An employer or a business you want to set up that needs to have customers can't necessarily carry on in a way that was successful before to be successful in the future. And I had to really, really quickly unlearn a load of the things that had made me really very successful at Ford. Maybe not the swearing bit, but some other stuff. Unlearn that and work out how am I going to get stuff done in a three, four hundred year old bank where the founders, by the way, still had a family member on the board, right? So my boss's boss took me shopping. I kid you not, think Pretty Woman. Any, any of you are old enough to watch Pretty Woman, right? And, and uh, Richard Gere takes, um, what's her name, Julia Roberts off shopping and she comes back with all these clothes so she knows how to dress at the polo match and all that kind of stuff. It was a bit like Pretty Woman, right? My boss takes, my boss's boss takes me shopping. I, I pay the bill, I'd like to point this out. But he takes me to his tailor. So I go and get some suits made. He shows me the type of shirt with double cuffs that you are supposed to wear and the right type of cutaway collar and collar stiffeners that will make you look like you fit in, and the right type of woven silk tie and the way to tie that tie so that you look like you've been there all your life. He told me about brogues, which are a type of English shoe with little patterns on the front and laces, right? And I bought some suits and some shirts and some ties. And I was different. I looked different in the morning. I even got a haircut. So, I took very conscious, career-conscious decisions about the way in which I was going to manage the stakeholders that I needed to manage to be able to get things done inside this big, old, large, stuffy English 400-year-old bank. And it worked. Okay? It really worked. And suddenly, I was being asked to do X, Y, and Z, and then I got sent down to Africa for the first time uh, as head of procurement and supply chain for the African Caribbean businesses. Boom. And then I got another great big role in, in the UK, back in procurement. And suddenly, in 1999, at the ripe old age of 27, 28, they said to me, would I like to become the chief procurement officer of Barclays Bank PLC, then one of the world's largest banks? I was 29. It would have made me something called a senior executive in Barclays Bank, and there wasn't another senior executive in Barclays Bank, which has 45,000 employees uh, under the age of 35, right? So dressing well sometimes gets you somewhere. And I said, no. Now you're going to think I'm mad again. So career consciousness, career pathing, career mapping. So let's unpack that one a little bit. So I'd left Ford, remember, for a very specific reason. I was worried about being pigeonholed as an automotive procurement person. I've now been very successful, bit by fortune, bit by luck, a huge amount by hard work to get offered a senior executive position as chief procurement officer of Barclays Bank at the age of 29. But I was really worried that if I'd said yes to that job, I would have then have done nearly 10 years only in one discipline, and that one discipline would have been procurement and supply chain. And I was deeply, deeply worried that that would have meant that all I'd ever be offered again in the future would be procurement and supply chain roles. Now, there are two types of career path that a human resources, I call them human remains, but that's fine, that a human remains or a human resources department will talk to you about. And you should be thoughtful about what type of career you want. Because at the moment, you're coming into a deeply specialized area. A deeply, deeply popular, hugely sexy, very valuable, but very specialized and limiting area. You're coming into data science and data analytics. I went into procurement, right? And I read economics. And my career success, as I've been promoted and promoted, have been all in that long but quite deep specialism of procurement and supply chain. And you will have that choice. You will be able to advance your careers and your earnings profile, which to me, remember, is very important, by going up a career path 
which is very tightly aligned to your specialism of data science and data analytics. Does that make sense? You're going to have that choice. You are in the biggest data science academy on the continent. If you know that, it's the biggest in Africa, right? It's massively well regarded. What Sean and the rest of the guys are teaching you here is absolutely top right hand corner awesome, okay? You will be in massive demand. You will be able to go up. You'll be able to go up that specialism, earn more money, do slightly larger jobs for quite a long time. I, was, I did it for nine, ten years nearly, right? But there will come a point when you've got to look yourself in the mirror and say, do I want to be a data scientist, a data analyst, even if I've got managerial responsibilities forever or not? And if the answer is yes, and it's a conscious yes, fantastic. Carry on what you're doing, because you're going to be able to shed a load of money doing what you're doing. You're going to have very valuable skills. You're never going to be without a job doing what you're doing. It's OK. But make it a conscious choice. And what I have seen over the years is a lot of people making this choice unconsciously and carelessly. And that isn't career management. Okay? That's an accident waiting to happen. Because you're going to wake up one morning thinking, shit, the bus has gone. I'm now 15 years in this, and I think I'm going to be viewed as too old by employers to change the way that I do stuff. So people talk about a T career and an I career. What I've just described to you is an I, you know, the letter I going up, and you've got a little dot at the top, and that will be the pinnacle of your success, and it could be a massively high pinnacle of success. You could be the world's highest earning data scientist, data analyst. There's nothing wrong with it, okay? And it may work for you and your family and everything else that you want to do. Nothing wrong with it. In fact, a lot of people make very valid choices around that and become massively successful. <coughs> or you can have something called a T career, where you go up that spike for a while, and then you choose to broaden across the top. You broaden across the top, and you create the letter T. And the broadening tends to involve picking up much wider management skills than you would otherwise get in a pure I. Does that make some sense? So I made a conscious decision to jump off the procurement bandwagon where I had created this I and start to broaden across the T. So I said to Barclays Bank, who was a very, very good quality employer, thank you. I am humbled. I am honored. I am so pleased that my suits did the trick. Um, but no, thank you. But would you honor that offer, uh, that seniority, for me to go and do another job somewhere else? And they said, you know what, Ian, probably not, because you were valuable to us because of all this stuff. And I said, we well, see, you've answered my question now. You value me because of those deep skills. And I actually made them very embarrassed. And they said, you know what, Ian, we'll give you, we'll give you a try out. And they moved me across into the operations and IT division. So looping a little bit back to the old days of Ford again, I suddenly end up running a load of technology and IT stuff. And in those days, banks were massive, massive IT houses and still are. So we had about 5,000 people in the IT shop in Barclays. It wasn't small. I led a, a whole load of work around uh, outsourcing and changing the way we did stuff and all sorts of things. And then, cutting a very long story short, I um, made another mistake. I made a very big mistake. A really big mistake. I got involved in politics. Business politics, not politics with a big P. I'm not talking about <laughs> Zuma and Ramaphosa and everything else. Not intentionally. It happens accidentally. You're going to have to watch out for this. Every business, and I suspect the Data Science Academy, has its own politics. We talk about it around the water cooler and the coffee machine, right? And my boss, but by then I was sort of, you know, this golden child. I was reporting directly to the executive committee of Barclays. I'd been, I was the youngest ever senior exec. I had this kind of path forward. And I was doing some stuff for my boss, who was on the Exco, which was contradicting what another member of the executive committee wanted to do. And they had a bit of a fallout. And as they say, when elephants dance, the grass gets trampled. When elephants fight, the insects die, right? And I was on the wrong side. And I got trampled. And I got sent down to a country called South Africa. <laughs> Entirely true story. Entirely true story. Um, so I got trampled. In fact, I got retrenched. I got retrenched because I got on the wrong side of the political battle. So when you start to become more senior, and you will if you choose to, because you're here, because you are, as I keep on saying, the cream of the crop, 
you are brighter than the vast majority of the population, you have made a conscious decision to dedicate yourself to some bloody hard work to go somewhere, you are good, okay? You are really good. You will go places. There's going to come a time when you get involved in politics, okay? And I've got a couple of tips on this one. Number one, don't. There's anything that you can possibly do, and I wasn't actively trying to do it, I caught in the sideways collateral damage, don't. Number one. Number two, never ever take a knife to a gunfight. Okay. All right. So if you're going to go out there, go out there armed and loaded for bear. Okay. Don't do what I did with that little pocket knife in my, in my, no, 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 no. The other guys are bazookas, right? So politics is the reality of working in large business. It's the reality of working in small business. It happens in your customer base. It happens in your supply base. It happens with your people. Stakeholder management, remember I talked about stakeholder management, the way that you work your way around, that is a critically important skill for you to be very thoughtful around to try and avoid getting caught in the trap that I got in caught in, which was this massive political bun fight. So I got retrenched. They closed down the business unit that I was running because my boss had fallen on the wrong side of everything and he was being asked to do some stuff differently and we were being closed down. So I got retrenched. I got my Section 189 style letter and got asked to go home. And whilst I was at home, I got a phone call, because politics are politics, right? From somebody who had also been affected, but you know, still had a couple of lifelines to use. It's like a phone a friend and want to be a millionaire. And he said, look, we are buying this small bank called ABSA in Johannesburg, South Africa. This is in 2004. And we can hide you down there for a while if you want to go. Um, and we need something to lead the, the mergers and acquisitions activity that's going down there, particularly as it relates to should we buy the bank uh, and how do they run operations, IT and all that kind of stuff. So I rocked up in December 2004 in my very smart pinstripe suit, right cuff, right collar, right tie, okay, outside 160 Main Street in Johannesburg, CBD, December the 14th. Not a great day. As us, pom as us pommies began to realize to try and get shit done in South Africa, right? December the 14th, right? So I rock up, okay, pinstripe suit, little black briefcase, got the picture, right? Off the plane, you know, I'm gonna, we're gonna buy this little colonial bank, you know, you wonder. Um, and, and Steve Boyson met us, who was the CEO at the time. Steve's a great guy, got himself involved in a bit of trouble recently around the Steinhoff uh, Audit Committee, but that's, that's just one of those things that happens, but he's a great, great guy, but also very well known for being incredibly casual. So he meets me in what I now understand I'm supposed to call slops and all that kind of good stuff, uh, and with a beach shirt on, because he's going to the beach tomorrow, because tomorrow is December the 15th, right? So it's party day at APSA, and I'm there with a couple of my mates. We're trying to buy this bank for a not inconsiderable sum of 2.6 billion pounds. Okay, I didn't have it all in my briefcase, but you know. And then there was this whole new set of stakeholder rules and cultural adjustment and engagement around how do the pommies get something done in a very different style of bank. So cutting a very long story short, uh, I helped the deal get done. We, we completed the acquisition of APSA in July 2005, and I've now been around long enough to see the seduction, the marriage, and the divorce of APSA and Barclays. But I came back to APSA at Steve's request uh, and left Barclays, and I ended up as, as an APSA employee, rather, to help them turn stuff around, because I loved it down here, and I've been in South Africa ever since, it's very much my home. Um, and now I made a very clear, conscious decision that I'd really, really messed up, okay? I had really screwed up in the UK with this political battle. I'd effectively lost my job. I was being given a second chance down here, and I was gonna keep my head down, I was gonna show people what I was good at. I went back to some procurement and supply chain stuff, I kept myself to myself, Suddenly we began to make some waves, the local industry picked up, and a few years later, Maria Ramos had come in and replaced Steve, um, and lots of things had changed at ABSA, and it felt like time for me to move on. I wasn't enjoying what I was doing there anymore. I'd been there too long, I'd been there nearly five years by the time I left. So consciously, I began to think about what do I want to do next. So now I've done automotive manufacturing, and there I did procurement and supply chain. I moved to a bank, I did a load of technology and operations stuff. I did mergers and acquisitions work. I joined ABSA, where I did procurement, but I also ran a lot of other things around property and HR and all sorts of other stuff. And then I thought, you know what? I need another sector. So I made a conscious decision on my T. I wanted to broaden myself 
that I wanted to really go and work in a different sector. And more by accident than by design, I got a phone call one day from a guy called Norman Adamy. Now, Norman, in those days, was the chairman and CEO of a business called South African Breweries. Anybody heard of SAB? <laughs> so I joined SAB, and again, using my specialism, because I wanted to get into another sector, I fell back on that procurement supply chain type stuff. Very quickly, I got asked to look at their global operating model. Suddenly I found my office was being transferred to Zug in Switzerland as we were globalized. So I, I did more work with SAB over the years I was there uh, around global operations than I did on supply chain. And I learned a lot of good stuff. SAB has got some fantastic skills. It will be out there as a potential employer for you guys in a year or two when you come out of this place. It is an awesome employer, okay? But hard, okay? It's not a charity. It's a hard, hard business. But I learned about brand and so on and so forth. So I'd left. Barclays and joined a big brewing firm. Now, when I joined Barclays, can anyone remember how big I said the company was? World's top 10 bank, yeah? In the top 10? When I left, it wasn't even in the top 100. When I joined Ford, it was in the top three companies in the world. When I left, it wasn't in the top 100. You're getting a theme, okay? When I joined SAB Miller, it was the world's second largest, world's second largest brewing house. It doesn't exist anymore. Just saying, okay? You might not want to hire me, okay? And as um, we were thinking about the sale of SAB Miller and, and I didn't like what was going on, I got a phone call from a guy called Sipa Maseko, who had just joined Telcom as the CEO. Uh, and he said, listen, Ian, uh, Telcom is running out of money. We are going to go bust. Uh, we need to do some pretty radical stuff. I'm not sure I can pay you when you join, but would you like to come in and run my turnaround uh, in Telcom? This was in 2013. And cutting a very long story short, I joined uh, Telcom at the end right at the beginning of 2014 and was really the architect with a couple of others behind the turnaround journey of Telcom. So why join Telcom? Well, I hadn't worked in the real technology sector before, so I was still broadening. It was a career conscious decision. It was a role that required some serious radical surgery, so I was going to get the opportunity on a much bigger stage to practice some of the stuff that we'd been doing. I was pretty much taking on the portfolio that owned the L on the P&L of Telcom. So I owned everything from all the people, so I ran HR, I ran uh, all the property, I ran all the back office work, you, you name it pretty much, I used to run it, okay, as it regards the L. And over the next three years we ran the most enormous, very structured, strategic turnaround program for Telcom, and the rest, as they say, is history. And I learned more, in that, I guess, in that three years than I'd learned in the previous sort of 12 or 13 with Barclays and SAB, because I was broadening my skill set. So I learned new things about running HR functions. I, I was continuing to learn. But I had a new set of stakeholders. Now I was working for a government-owned entity as a white Englishman, right? Interesting, that one. So yeah, another set of things, that, and all the time being thoughtful. And finally, as, as, as we said in the introduction, uh, we bought in Telcom, we bought a company called BCX. It's Africa's largest technology company these days, turns over a couple of billion dollars, 10, 12,000 people, and I ran that for 18 months. And I made a very conscious decision at the end of the 18 months to move on. Why? So you're getting the theme here, right? I'm, I, I get personally, and you've got to be thoughtful around this, to the end of a road with something. When I've done what I can do, and somebody else may be able to do it better than you, but also you've got to make some personal choices. Uh, I have a young family, I wasn't getting to see them, so, and you know, I thought, you know, I've done this CEO thing, now I've done this. So I made another conscious decision, a thoughtful decision about learning some new skills. I left that business in the middle of last year and I spent the last six or seven months doing something completely different, which has been setting up my own kind of portfolio of things. I've written a book, which I've never done before, okay? So I've learned a whole process about how you get something published, how you get artwork done for the cover, how you write so somebody wants to publish it. I've learned all sorts of new stuff about something I know nothing about. I've become an advisor and a board director of a number of companies to try and help them become successful using some of the knowledge that I've learned. So I'm now learning some new skills about, I'm not management anymore, I'm not an executive. I can only advise and suggest and counsel and cajole. I'm doing some work like this in terms of public speaking and talking to people. So I'm building up a whole new, at the right pole, I'm approaching 50, right? You know, approaching 50, I'm beginning to build up a whole new portfolio of skills that I haven't had before, but they're rooted in the core of things that I've learned at the beginning of the I that became a T, and it may now just becoming a cross, because I'm not quite sure what I'm doing, right? So the reason for telling a very long story 
is really just to think about some of the lessons that are in there. Number one, and I said I'd come back to some of these things, career consciousness. You've got to choose your own narrative and own your career. Don't let it be done to you. What I've done isn't right or wrong, it's what I've done. What you do will be what you do, it won't be right or wrong. But make those decisions consciously. And if you need people around you to advise, get them in place early. People talk about a personal board sometimes. A group of friends that you can get around a, a bar table or a coffee table once or twice a year and just have a chat with them about where you're going. Share the problem, share your thoughts, get some feedback. Okay. So own, career conscious, own, own your narrative. Really, really critical. Remain relevant. Don't be the Kodak. Okay? Don't be the South African Post Office. Keep your skill set and how you do things relevant to what the economy needs. Right now, you are the absolute peak of relevance. Nothing could be more relevant than what you are studying. But in 20 years' time, you're history. You're toast. Okay? It'd be finished. Everything that I thought was really relevant when I started my career doesn't exist anymore. Or it's ten a penny. So process engineering, well, everybody does that, okay? So think about your personal relevance as part of that career conversation with yourself. Think about the skill of stakeholder management. How do you influence and bring people with you and don't become the person that gets trampled by the elephants like I did? How do you get people to want to own your narrative and come with you on your journey to get stuff done? Because if you get stuff done, people want to hire you. You're going to be the brightest person around, but if you can't get stuff done, there's no output. There's no gearbox to your high-powered engine. So think about your relevance to a business and the relevance of your skills to an economy all the time in that career conscious conversation. And the final thing I said we could touch back on is communications. And it's a bit like another angle on that gearbox. Because if you can't explain yourself, you can't get your message across, you can't persuade and influence people using either the written word or the voice, then how is your idea going to get out? How are you going to be successful in getting things done around here? So work on communication. Work on it really hard. Written, I think, in this day and age becomes less and less important, quite frankly, but it is still a skill. As I keep on telling my children, you still need to learn to write. But daddy, I can put it in the iPad, sure. But actually, the written word remains important to us and our society. But this, the presentation, the ability to talk to people with confidence, without notes, and understanding what's going on, is something you need to work on. It is something that is hugely persuasive when you're selling. And remember, every day when you're working, you're selling yourself, because that's what people are paying for. So really, go out there and think about, how can I work on my communication tools? And if I was to just to say, you know, people always ask me, well, what would you suggest to do? There's a couple of things, very simply. There's a great friend of mine called Rich Mulholland. Google Rich Mulholland, and I'll sell him the guys for the details afterwards. He has his own YouTube channel. He works just around the corner from here. He's only a couple of kilometers away. And he, he posts a new YouTube video every single week, give or take. And the bulk of what he does is talk about how you can improve the way that you convey messages. His company called Missing Link. The idea, the missing link is your idea and somebody understanding your idea. So all he does is work with individuals and businesses to help them communicate better. And he posts a five, six minute thought piece every week or so on his YouTube video. Just watch them. He swears even more than I do, okay? And he's a bit of a biker, but other than that, he's a good guy. And really, just those, and there are lots of those kind of guys and girls out there. So have a think about how you invest in yourself. You don't need a personal coach and all that nonsense. Just look at people you respect and admire that do things like this, and think about what is it they have done that I can copy, and that I will feel comfortable of, and then you're gonna to have to start using that phone of yours, that PC of yours, and start filming yourselves and watching it back, and it is cringe-making. But invest in some time on communication skills. It's a critical gift that very rarely gets taught, but is a, a key part of your success. So I think I've talked for about 55 minutes. Damn, I'm good. Um, 55 minutes on the dot with no clock. Notice that. Uh, I promised at the beginning that I would open this up for any questions and thoughts that we might have in this room. We have a, a group as well in Johannesburg that I believe can message us as well. But let's take any, uh, any questions, thoughts, or comments from Cape Town first. Well, I put you all to sleep. Run over here. Yeah, so the question is, how do you avoid getting involved in politics? And, and I think it's very difficult. Uh, I've learned to try and be as neutral and as agnostic as possible. 
In other words, you know, just trying to make sure that you're seeing more as a person that bridges the gap rather than divides further. But it isn't always possible, and there are times you've got to stand up for yourself. I mean, the business world has things that you think will be right and other things that you think are wrong, and you've got to stand up for it sometimes. So, but I think the important thing is if you're going to stand up for something, make sure you're standing up for a principle that you really believe in. And it's less about politics then, it's about you think it's the right thing. Uh, be careful what you say um, to anybody, and be even more careful about what you write down. I'm old enough to remember the fax machine, okay? The fax and a telex machine. Now, I remember in Ford, sending out this document to a supplier, uh, making a slightly sarcastic comment to somebody else on the fax, but sending the wrong fax to the wrong person. <laughs> We've all done it, right? It's even easier with WhatsApp and email. So you've got to assume that what you say and what you write down, somebody's going to hear. So it's being very conscious and very thoughtful. But if you're going to act with integrity and you believe in something, then believe in something and act with integrity. Don't, don't become a yes man, because that's not going to help anybody either. So it's tough, okay? And some of it's learning by doing. I've learned the hard way, but I learned. And I think I, I kind of made my, made my peace with that and moved on. But yeah, good question. Thank you. Young lady? Hi. Um, so my question is, how do you find the balance between your profession and your personal life to be able to like, sure. get successful but not be like found in that? Sure. So how did I find the success between sort of work and, and, and real life, right? Yeah. I didn't, um, is the honest answer. So, you know, during the course of that, you know, career path, uh, a load of failed relationships, um, which never to be happens because you're not at home a great deal. Uh, and one of the, the, the key drivers behind me leaving BCX and doing what I'm doing now was a long and difficult conversation with the family in Easter last year. We'd gone on holiday. I've got two uh, young boys. They're aged nine and seven now. They were then eight and six. Uh, we'd been on holiday, went out to Durban for a week. Uh, and one of them said, it's really nice to have daddy back again. And I said, what do you mean? Because well, I was really good. Right? I was taking them to school and everything, you know? So I dropped them at the school gate at seven. So my working pattern at BCX was I get up at half past four. I do two hours of, of email getting the admin out of the way. I nip in the shower, take the boys to school, drop them off at seven at the dot. School opens at seven. I drop them at the dot. Rushed up the road to work, tried to get home for bedtime stories at seven. But the feedback, I said, I said, what do you mean? I said, well, you're here. That's lovely, Dad, but you don't listen to us and you're not really here. You're too tired and, and, and. Uh, and it was very interesting when I, when I resigned from BCX and I phoned my wife and said, right, uh, we've done all the press stuff. I can pick the boys up from school today. He said, fantastic. No, please do. So I'm driving down the motorway and I phone my wife back and I say, where do I pick them up from? <laughs> I hadn't picked them up for over a year. I get to the school and they're really now worried that something's happened to their mum. What are you doing here, Dad? What's wrong? What's happened? <laughs> they thought Mum had had an accident, right? And when you do that, that's a mirror that gets held up to say, you've got something badly wrong. So a big part of what I've been trying to do over the last seven or eight months is massively recalibrate that work-life balance. I didn't get it right. I think it's incredibly difficult. The only thing that I will say is I don't think what's right for me is right for you or right for the person that sits next to you. And somehow you have to find something that keeps you honest, whether it's your partner, a group of friends, or your inner belief, but you have to do something that's right for you. And I can't answer what it is because I got it wrong. Yeah. This one over there. <laughs> so the book is called The Other End of the Telescope, which is a phrase used by the American children's author, Dr. Zeus, if you've heard of Dr. Zeus. Uh, and he, he uses that phrase to really think about a problem in a different way, looking down the other end of the telescope, thinking about something very differently. It's a collection of essays uh, around how difficult it is to get stuff done in large organisations uh, and what you can do differently to get things done in large organisations. Uh, it's written primarily by myself. I've got four co-conspirators. Um, so there are three or four other voices in the book that have written chapters, essays as well. Uh, I think it adds a nice balance uh, and it gives a much more South African flavour to, to some of the things I'm talking about. It is out on the 1st of April and I shall make sure that the Explore Data Science Academy orders a copy for all of you. Uh, and all of the proceeds are going to a school, which is not too far away from here, called Christel House, which takes kids in from the Ottery area at the age of three and looks after them to the age of 18. It's a, a not-for-profit school. So all the proceeds from the book will be going to that school because unless we use education as the way to break the cycle of poverty, nothing else will happen in this country. 
Uh, and that's what I'm trying to do with the book. I'm trying to help educate people like yourselves around how to get stuff done in business. But actually, I want the proceeds then to go to another ed uh, education institution as well. So I will make sure that Sean and the guys get all of the pre-sale stuff in March, and it comes out in April. But thank you. So the question is, what specific skills do I look for when hiring somebody? It depends. I mean, you know, if I'm looking for a head of IT, I probably want some IT knowledge. But if there were three things at a senior level I would look for, I'd look for, can you manage stakeholders? Can you get stuff done? Do you have a track record of delivery? Not talking about stuff, but having made things happen in a previous organization. So that stakeholder management is important, getting stuff done is important, and then the leadership skills themselves. Now, what feedback do I get about you as a leader that, that gives you the right to ask other people to do things? Do you lead with credibility? Do you lead with authority? Do you just tell people and have a cup of tea? And what's your leadership style? And is that a style that's going to work in the organization that I'm running? So they would be the three things I would look for. Okay. Anything from Johannesburg, by the way? Are we? Yeah, let's, 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 yeah take a couple from the chairbook. Okay, um, first one, what's next for you, Ian? Um, a glass of wine in about half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, as I said earlier, I am building up a portfolio of things that, I'm try that I'm, I think will be interesting. Uh, I've tried the writing a book. I've loved it. I haven't done it to make money, but I've done it to learn a new skill, and, and that, that was fascinating for me. So I think there'll be another book. Uh, I'm doing quite a lot of advisory work, mainly for companies that are struggling to turn themselves around uh, and just need the voice of experience about the mistakes that have been made and how we can get stuff done around here. So that's taking up some of my time. Uh, and I am sitting on some not-for-profit boards. Uh, I mean, a good example is City here upstairs, Ian Mellington's group. I sit on that board, not-for-profit. We think code. Uh, I'm joining their board. So, so some other things that I'm doing on a not-for-profit basis. So they're the three kind of things I'm doing and, and honoring my promise to the family to be at home and to be actually present uh, an awful lot more. Yeah. Another one from Joe Book? Yeah. Yep. Be fair. How does one know when it is time to move from an I trajectory to a T trajectory? You alluded to the fact that there's a late mover risk. What about early mover risk? Yeah, there's both, right? Uh, and, I, and I can't give you a perfect answer to when's the right time. From a personal perspective, I knew that I was getting stale. I was getting tired. I was doing the same thing over and over again, and I personally wasn't learning. So one thing I would say to that question that somebody taught me when I was a lot younger, uh, one of my early bosses at Ford, he said, your career is like a conveyor belt. And the conveyor belt can be measured in years. And the conveyor belt has space on it for five years or five boxes. Okay? And each one of those boxes represents a skill or an experience that you have. And as this conveyor belt moves, every year, one of those boxes drops off. So if you like, you're now in 2019, right? So the 2014 box is about to drop off in terms of the skills and experience you put into that box. Is the box that you're now going to load onto that conveyor belt in 2019 of equivalent or better value than the box which is dropping off in 2014? If the answer is no, get the hell out of where you are. Okay? If the answer is yes, and it's still sufficiently good, great. If the answer is not sure, go and have a few conversations <coughs> with people. And I really liked that analogy. And actually, my career accident rather than maybe design, but it's often moved in broad kind of five-year cycles. So I would you know, be very thoughtful about your career as a conveyor belt and use that staleness test. And am I putting a new box onto that five-year conveyor belt, which is materially better than the, the box that's just about to drop off? You guys are doing that right now. You are learning a fantastic and new skill, which is going to be demonstrably different than what many of your age peer group have got and that you learned five years ago. But you've got to be equally clear in 2024 that your answer is the same. Any more from Joe Book? And then we'll take one from the room here. Yeah, we've got, uh, let's, let's alternate. We've got another five minutes, so it's fine. Yeah. I'm not fully sure I understand the question. Just say it again. So on the topic of resigning, any advice on the decision about whether to stay loyal to the first big company that hired and trained you <laughs> versus your personal growth? 
No. So, so, so loyalty is, is great when you're married, okay? <laughs> it's great when you've got a dog. But you've got to remember that the only thing you're likely to be in most organizations is a temporary and small cog in a very large machine. And when your temporary and small cog drops out of the very large machine, they won't notice. Okay? And even if you get very senior and you think you're really, really important and you're a really big cog and their place can't possibly work without you, trust me, the corporate DNA and the machinery around you will make a plan. So the loyalty needs to be to yourself and your personal development and your personal aspiration, <coughs> not to the organization that chooses to pay you. Remember, they're paying you fairly, I hope, for a fair output. It's a transaction. Don't get misled into, th into th thinking it's marriage, okay? So keep loyalty for marriage and be much more cynical around the way in which you work for people. Another local question? Did you decide to um, run into the team? Um, what would you say? How, how far should you run from? Is it like outside of run too far? Or is it like a limited to yeah. So the question is, as you branch on the T, how, how far along can you extend it? Uh, at risk or not at risk. And what I've done each time is retain something that I know is a, is a personal sweet spot. So I knew when I went from Ford to the bank that I was going to rely on my professional skills as a procurement person as my sweet spot to have credibility, to allow me to move into another industry. When I moved from um, banking to SAB Miller, I did the same thing again. When I moved from SAB to Miller to Telcom, it was a bit more, I had much more global understanding. I, I was leaning much more on management skills. But you've got to have something that remains core and relevant to a set of skills that you've got. If you go too far, you hang out there, you know, it's a bit like a tennis, asking a tennis player to go and be a golf player overnight. You, know, you, you might still be a round ball and something you hit it with, but it's totally different. So you've got, you've got to have enough congruence, enough association with what's made you successful before to give you credibility in that stretch out. In, in my view, yeah. One from Joe Berg? Yes. Um, how do companies like IBM stay relevant? And apart from selling data to corporates and information, what value does big data hold capitalism? How do big companies stay relevant? So I give a whole separate uh, talk on relevance. Uh, IBM didn't stay relevant. Okay, let's be really honest about this. IBM has had the most torrid time. It's rediscovering relevance after one of the most difficult, difficult times in, in history. Remember, IBM started making cheese graters as its first product. Anybody know that? 1919, whenever it was, first product from IBM, uh, Thomas Watson started selling uh, cheese graters. He, he moved from cheese graters into typewriters. He moved from typewriters into bigger typewriters. He moved from type... Um, and by accident, he stumbled on all this computing stuff. And Watson was an awesome salesman, and he built this enormous colossus around, not solid state, but around the mainframe. And of course, what happened then is they, did, again, underestimated the impact of DOS and everything else that went around Microsoft and the operating system on the PC. And the company nearly died because it lost its relevance. It lost its relevance. Remember that f famous old quote um, from one of the early IBM guys saying they could never see a reason for there being any more than six computers in the world, right? They lost their relevance. They rediscovered their mojo only in the last couple of years. They're still rebirthing. So IBM is a good example of a company that just about had enough financial muscle and will to get itself through. But relevance really sits around, do you understand what your customer wants and needs? Okay? What your customer wants and needs? And your career relevance is, do you understand what an employer or the economy wants and needs? And the second you stop asking that question over and over again, you start to go down the path of losing your relevance. That's what happened to Kodak and Blockbuster, uh, Nokia, Blackberry. I mean, the, the list is endless of people who lost their relevance because they stopped asking the question what they wanted. If I give you sort of, you know, one, one fascinating, I think, insight into the world that we live in, has anybody here heard of a company called WhatsApp? Yep, anybody use WhatsApp? Has anybody ever phoned the WhatsApp help desk? Has anybody ever found the WhatsApp help desk? There's no such thing, right? There's no such thing. Why? Does WhatsApp ever go wrong? It had one outage last year, the first in its history for about six hours, and the Canadians worried about it, right? But so what, what was the relevance of that? So what WhatsApp has done is it realized early on, Brian Acton is the founder, 
Brian uh, worked out very early on with his mate in 2009 that now we had this thing in our palm that connected us to the internet, all we really wanted was always on ability to communicate. And that was, the that was the founding principle behind WhatsApp. He understood that your relevance was your ability to communicate, not your ability to make a cell phone call, and not your ability to make an SMS, and not your ability to send an email. It was just to communicate. He completely rethought through what the customer relevance was of the device in your palm. And now, as a consequence of that, he has disintermediated the SMS, the national telcos, you name it, right? I mean, it's just, it's just class lists or whatever. WhatsApp has begun to totally disintermediate a shed load of businesses and things that made a lot of money because they didn't understand that what they did was going to become irrelevant. So WhatsApp at the moment is the biggest single irrelevance threat to many businesses as a consequence. Even things like Skype, which five, six years ago was seen as like you know, this great, big, enormous behemoth that was going to dominate, it's disappeared. I mean, who uses Skype anymore? Only if you've got to talk to an old-fashioned business do you use Skype, right? Why? Because they didn't do everything else that disintermediates that WhatsApp can do for you. I've got another, and I'll do another talk on WhatsApp that I'm not going to give now. But just ask yourself tonight when you go home, how does WhatsApp make money? That's your exam question for tonight. You're very clever people. You can go and work it out. One last question, please. So, Jeremy, great name, by the way, for working in a bank. There were a lot of Jeremy's, right? <laughs> we had a lot of Jeremy's. Antony's, Oliver's, Jeremy, you know you get it, right? Um, so, Jeremy. Um, sure, so... Pleasing stakeholders and being congruent with stakeholder understanding is an important part of what we do. Pushing those same stakeholders to understand where you can be more relevant and make more money is equally important. And that's what you do as a senior leader. And most shareholders, if you talk about them specifically, which that question does, as a stakeholder, care about making more money. You only buy a stake in a company to make more cash. It's very straightforward, right? So if you're going to come up with something that demonstratively has a greater chance of keeping you relevant for longer and make you more cash, then normally the shareholder is not going to have a problem with that. So I hear you. you. You cannot appease at the expense of making the wrong decisions, but also you're very thoughtful about how you manage your arguments to persuade people that they can come with you on the journey that you're talking about. So it's a fine balance. It's about not getting trampled by the elephants. It's about not becoming too cynical, but it is about making sure that you stand up for what you think is right. Otherwise, if you don't stand up for what you think is right, well, what are you doing, right? There's no satisfaction at the end of the day. None at all. Okay, guys, it is quarter to 12. We have run out of time. I hope you found that useful and interesting. As a final parting shot, and I believe in, in this institution, I believe in you massively. You are part of something special. You have the opportunity to do something special as a consequence of being part of something special. What the team have set up here and the energy and effort that you have put in to become part of what has been set up here is quite remarkable. The next year or so is yours to lose, okay? It's yours to lose. You have the most incredible opportunity. Grab it with both hands, take everything that you can from it, and be really proud of what you're going to do and what you've already done to get here. So I want to give yourselves a round of applause and thank you very much indeed. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much.